All right. So Matt has Matt, you're actually the first returning guest for the Jerk Shop series. Oh shit. I think you were uh you were on the third episode and now you're back here on the eighth. So we have a little celebratory anniversary of Matt Wall returning. Cheers. To the, really good. Uh, <laughs> we've got we've 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 been on so long we've graduated to the beers uh listeners heavy bored heavy i am heavy 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 bored But I wanted to take it because we already talked workshop stuff and uh, all that last time. Listeners go back and listen to that. You can see that on the, on the feed, podcast feed. But I wanted to talk with Matt about something a little different. So a little bit different of a workshop series here where it's related to workshops, but it's different, right? I wanted to talk to Matt about self-publishing and that kind of rapidly growing industry that's happening around us here. Uh, mainly because Matt has done this for a long time. And he's achieved success off of it. You know, uh, we're not talking about anybody becoming a millionaire here, listeners, but it's still like self-publishing, as I always say, like it's, it's, it's become more important, particularly for writers that are doing something a little different or outside the mainstream big five presses, you know. It's become so important to the literature and the literary world, I feel like. And I feel like it's not getting its, 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 the credit it deserves right now. Whereas, you know, we talked about this a little in the last episode. We can get into more of it here where, like, you, the publishers are fishing now. So if you're a self-published writer that has just been doing it for a few years on Amazon, well, now they're fishing around for people. Oh, you sell books? You sell books on your own? You know, like... And they start reaching out to you, being like, well, we'll sign you, we'll sign this, this deal and give you more money or whatever. And you can point to the Colleen Hoovers and things like that that have made a lot of money starting off with self-publishing, moving to like the big contract, big fives. And I just, it's so important. And I feel like there's a lot of stigma around it too. You know, like the, the self-publishing stigma, which I want to get into and all that. So Matt's been kind enough to come here and chat about it. Uh, I just wanted to start off, Matt, with with what got you started self-publishing? Like, how did you just get into this? How did it start? Frustrations? I, I, I was trying to get out of film. Um, I thought I was either going to murder a producer or have a heart attack um, with just how angry I was and how people with money had taken something that I loved my whole life and turned it into something that that I was not looking forward to. Mm -hmm. And, um, in the mid two thousands, I published a few books with a small press before I started like making film. And once I got into filmmaking, I didn't really do anything else. I was just doing that because it was so fun. The money was so good. It was just great. And you were writing and and directing, right? You were like a writer director. Yeah. And so, and I was doing that under the creep creeperson name because I was in this band called creeperson, yada, yada, yada. Everything moves into the next thing. How is how it was. But Um, And then this was right before the Kindle Gold Rush happened. So we're talking like like 2011. Right. This dude who um, I was making a couple movies for tried to convince me to let him start putting out these things called ebooks of my scripts. And said that there's a lot of money to be made in it. You know, let's do it. And he's like, it's really easy. Anyone can do it. And so I was like, well, if anyone can do it, why am I going to let you do it for me? Like, why don't I just fucking do it? You know, like, 
just give you half of what I'm making for no fucking reason. Fuck you, you know, yeah. and I didn't really think anything else about it until like I felt like I was going to die. Like literally, I thought my body was going to give up. I was so unhealthy and um, my stress was out of control. And that uh, people don't understand that in the film and high stress industry. And you were even, you weren't even, you said you weren't even working for the huge studios. You were doing indie studio stuff, right? Writing your scripts and then being able to direct them on kind of smaller budgets. Yeah. And like, even that is such a high stress, 16 hour days, you know, like just kind of incredible stress. And then you said you lose some creative control, right? Like you start having interference. Like you're, you're making a movie that you think is your movie. And then all of a sudden, the producer got into a fight with his boyfriend and now suddenly he's like, Hey, um, I need you to um, put this one person in the movie and you've already shot half the movie. <sighs> and suddenly there's this new person that needs to be the star of the movie for whatever fucking reason. And then you're like, Oh, we're, we're shooting tomorrow and I have to now make this person, the new care, the main character. And we've shot the movie all out of order like, like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, I'm getting mad again. Just right. thinking about it. like that shit happened all the fucking time. And um, I don't know. And I had a bunch of short stories that I had written like 10 years prior. And um, I just remember that dude talking about like ebooks. And so like I looked into it and I'm like, oh, OK, so I'll just make a book cover and, you know, put a book up on Amazon and just see what happens. And I did one, and it was um, this story called Unsane Sam. And I, I sold a bunch of copies of it, and I didn't even fucking do anything. I right. just put it up, and it just was selling. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I'm like, yeah, but that's not enough money to like make me like live. And then I'm like, oh, okay, so I'll just put out a new ebook every week, and then that should make me be able to fucking live, right? So the whole thing was me chasing the dragon of trying to – figure out a way to make as much money as I was in film. And then as I was doing it, I was just putting out old shit. Like I wasn't like writing anything new. And then when I started writing something new, I was like, Oh my God, I could have a helicopter blow up. If I want, there's no budget restrictions. I could do whatever the fuck I want. Right. And it was immediately so freeing. And so I just started writing these like ridiculous, like bizarro shit. And like anything, like if there was a special effects scene that I wanted to do on a movie a couple years earlier that I wasn't able to do for financial reasons, I would like write a whole book around just making sure I could do this one thing that I wasn't allowed to do in film. And it just started going. And then um, from there, I took this um, TV pilot that I was pitching around and turn that into a weekly serial. And that was the first time I started making really good money. And again, this is like 2012 now. 2013. <coughs> so um, by this time, the Kindle Gold Rush was up and moving and going and motherfuckers right. were making ridiculous amounts of money. Ebooks were a new thing. They were new. Yeah. And you could get the Kindles at Barnes & Noble. Like the print books mm -hmm. were going down. And it was like, yeah. It was a new technology even and it seems it wasn't even that long ago you know and it's already it was, like 10 years ago like the idea that you could write a book in a week if you wanted to not edit it and put it up on amazon and start making money on it like because like when i was doing the serial i would um start writing the episode on like thursday have it done by Sunday, spend Monday working on the book cover, and then have it up and out on Tuesday. Right. It was like immediate. And that rush was so amazing. And doing a weekly release schedule is fucking stupid. I don't recommend anyone ever fucking doing that. High stress, but, yeah. But it was like I was used to that right. kind of fast deadlines having to fucking move. So transitioning from – having to do deadlines like that where people were getting in your way all the time and making shit difficult to having it be no one's in my way and I could just go. That was so freeing. 
And so that Black Star Canyon series, it's changed over the years, like different covers, different titles, but that, um, and I went through this period where I changed my pen name like 13 fucking times, which was stupid. I should never, I should have stuck with one name and just went with it. But um, that was like Black Star got me out of having to rely on other people for like my livelihood i guess and for listeners that don't know black star is uh, like a horror series that you were doing it's it's i guess so that would probably be the best way to put it like i didn't look at it as horror i looked at it more as just like a mystery but there were so many horrific and sci-fi elements to it that like um and another reason why the amazon algorithm fucks you is if your book fits into too many holes amazon don't know how to sell it for you like they want something that is exactly this or exactly that. And um, it wasn't until 2013 or 2014, Amazon changed the algorithm because <clears throat> you used to be able to put a book out for free for five days. And then after those five days, the book ranking would stay the same. And that's how all these people were getting fucking rich overnight. And when they changed that, um, like you put your book out for free to get attention for it. Then when it would come out of free, it would like go back down to zero and then you'd have to work that up again. And that's what made a lot of people like their whole business model, like went to shit, like a, as much as people got rich overnight writing eBooks, a bunch of people went broke overnight writing right. ebook when they changed that. And they've changed little things here and there along the years to make things more difficult. Like when KU came out, Kindle Unlimited, like the Netflix for eBooks, that fucked up a lot of people's business models. And some people couldn't come back from it, you know. But <clears throat> with me, having a giant catalog means that I don't need to have a bestseller. I just need to have a lot of books out. And I will do okay, kind of thing. So yeah. there's that. There's I'm I'm fascinated by this because I think, like I said in the beginning, that there's a stigma around self publishing, but then you're seeing people like Matt and there's <laughs> others that are getting that are able to do it for a living almost. And there's 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 a writer I've talked about it before, and, and some listeners will be familiar with this guy. He goes by Delicious Tacos online and he writes these very sexual, masculine, kind of horny, you know, kind of almost erotica things. Yeah. But they're very much centered around the online world and being obsessed with women and, and getting obsessed with a girl and stalking her or something. And like he's been doing it himself. We're just self publishing on Amazon in print and ebook format. And you know, I think he's, it's been like 10 years of him doing this, building up his own reputation online for years. And I think he's reached a point now where he sold like over 40,000 copies of his books, just doing that. No marketing. He paid no money for it. He was just doing it himself, posting on Twitter, posting on, you know, self-publishing these books, um, running flash sales himself, you know, marketing stuff himself, doing all of that. And, you know, he's found an audience, even though it's small compared to, you know, he's not selling a hundred thousand copies or a million copies, but it's like for no but marketing. Like every week, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah, and he has a blog that he puts out stuff and then puts it into a book form after he gets enough and stuff. And I've tried to get him on. If you're out there, dis- delicious tacos, tacos, come on the pot. I've been trying to get him on uh to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, not just his like polarize he's kind of polarizing online and stuff and but like it, I'm just fascinated by that. Like the industry that's creeping up because the main big five and like the regular publishing industry is not paying attention to these other audiences where you can build yourself up. And Matt, you're publishing poetry now too. And I think that is underestimated. Whereas that's a smaller audience anyway, and you're going to get less sales no matter what doing poetry, but you're still doing it, you know, like, and you're getting those books out there, getting sales, the, the poetry thing came out of doing the zines and the chapbooks because, like, I really fought how poetry looks in an ebook for a long time. 
and I was never going to do digital copies of my poetry. And then, um, so I was just making like homemade chat books and those sell really good, especially for how much it costs to make them, you know? And, um, that was great. And then I read this cause for a couple years now, I've been trying to get like hard data numbers on poetry sales from the big five. Oh, that's going to be, so, they, they keep those under lock and key, baby. Yeah. Seriously. It was so fucking difficult to find anything. And then I finally found this one article and I did a podcast about it like a year ago, but I found this one fucking study an article or whatever the fuck it is. And they said 70% of people who read poetry say they do it digitally. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like, I've, like, maybe shot myself in the foot here. Like, right. I need to pivoting. I need to transition into more digital. So I had this plan that I was going to start putting out um, a chapbook in digital form every week. And I did that for three weeks. And then, like, my life fell apart. And so I kind of put the brakes on it. But I'm getting back into it now. But... Um, I'm actually surprised at how well those have done, you know, um, as opposed to like, I didn't think they would do very well at all. And I thought the chat books would still be the thing. But the idea was if I could trick Amazon into like making Matt wall synonymous with poetry because of how many books I'm putting out, right. I will have to eventually show up in people's searches so that's kind of like the game plan right economies now. of scale yeah this is what they're doing in the streaming world too with songs and stuff why is yeah, taylor so, swift yep. putting out 20 track albums well because now with this way you stream music you have 20 tracks instead of 10 or 12 more chance to hit an algorithm and have it recommended even if it's not a single or something for somebody like a huge artist like taylor swift you know yeah for real and then if like people are just buying singles right or like yeah. not even that just like stream time is probably the same as like watch time on YouTube and Amazon does Amazon I imagine gives you very pretty solid metrics right like you can see who are returning customers and who are new no. customers no no they don't really tell you anything other than kind of demographics and how much you're selling okay if Amazon were to give like customer information to people like everyone would be rich like if you were able to get the emails of the people who are buying your books from amazon like you would fucking never need to sell another book on amazon again and amazon knows this so they don't fucking put that information out so or i didn't like, know if it was like because like youtube gives you pretty pretty good metrics for as far as social media where they tell you new viewers returning viewers like this kind of yeah. Like they'll tell you, like at what second do people think your video sucks? Right. You know? Yeah. Like if this video, how many subscribers you lost, how many subscribers you gained. Right. Like um, YouTube's great. Amazon has all this information. They just don't share it. Right. And there, I mean, I mean, yeah. And I mean, you know, there's limits to what they could share legally, I'm sure. But in terms of personal information, but you would think something like sales metrics, or something yeah. you would be easy enough to share anonymously without, you know, giving you any information other than just this person bought it for the first time or this person just bought three of your books. Like, Hang on, man. I'm sorry. yeah, no worries, bro. Sorry, man. After drinking like three beers, I had to fucking get rid of one of them. Yeah, yeah no worries, bro. But no, this is like shit. I'm like super fucking passionate about. Yeah. <laughs> like, That's why I wanted to pick your brain on this and, and, and not irritated. just, yeah, and not just expand what we talk about on a workshop episode, but like the other angles of writing, because workshopping is one part of writing. Every single person listening to this could be making not like a great living, but you could be getting your work in front of people right. and making money selling ahead. books. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not fucking hard, but like the when you were talking about the stigma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get into that. Yeah. It's not nearly as bad as it used to be. Right. Like, like fucking goddamn, like 10 years ago, right. it was like vicious cutthroat. Like, if you self-publish at all, we will never put your books out. It was fucking like traditional publishers were like, fuck you guys. You guys are trying to kill us. Right. Like, suck a dick. And then um, I think it was Hugh Howie 
started because I mean he did the wool series and became a millionaire overnight basically and um, he started doing this thing where every month and I, I'm sure he doesn't do it anymore but um, back in the day he was doing it where every month he would put out Amazon sales numbers for genres that he based off of um, the bestseller rankings because like Amazon doesn't give you this information, but if you study it, you could kind of have a decent idea of what is happening and what people are doing. And then when the big publishers were using Amazon to put their shit out, they um, he started like correlating like traditional publishers to self publishers, who's making more, who's making less. And then once he got into traditional publishing, he was able to see like what most people would get on a traditionally published book and be able to tell you like, can you make more money self publishing or can you make more money traditionally publishing? Um, and it was like just eye opening and crazy. And once those numbers started coming public, that's when shit got really fucking like intense and weird. And then I don't know if you remember this, but there was a period where Hachette or Hatchet, however you fucking say the name of that publisher, and Macmillan or whatever, um, they had a falling out with Amazon and Amazon wasn't selling their shit anymore. And a bunch of authors who were traditionally published started losing a ridiculous amount of money and couldn't figure it out. And then when it came out, it was because their books are not on Amazon. Right. They lost their fucking mind. And they're like, is Amazon really all of our fucking market? And then it started to come out that most of the places traditionally published books are being sold is on fucking Amazon. Right. It turned into the thing like, oh, the traditionally published world are really just self-publishers. Like they're doing the exact same thing that self-publishers are doing, but they're just not as good at it. Right. You know? So um, it was – all of that shit was really weird. And now I think what it is like – because when you had people like Brandon Sanderson like walk away from traditionally published shit to self-publish because he's making so much fucking more money. Oh, like, yeah. dude, Millions. Somebody who like was like, hmm, I don't know. I think I'm going to try this. Like that motherfucker – is minted as fuck now. Right. Is that shit. And um, a lot of other people in different genres walked mm-hmm. away from traditionally published shit to self-publish and just started making so much money that, like, I think the stigma now isn't nearly as bad as it used to be, but there is a prestige that a lot of people in our age group feel like they still need. Yes. But in 10 years, that's not going to be there at all. Because the people who are going to be writing books in 10 years are going to be the instant gratification TikTok motherfuckers of this generation. And all of that traditionally published bullshit will not fucking matter at all. I'm not saying traditional publishing is going to die, but they're going to have to fucking adapt really quick. And they're not known for adapting. And the analogy that somebody told me like a decade ago was it's like if you're in a ski boat or a jet ski and you need to turn around real quick, you just turn around. If you're on an aircraft carrier and you need to turn around real quick, it's going to be a while. Yeah. And that's the difference between the like big five and everybody else. Yeah. You know? And I'm, I'm, I like the, I'm fascinated about this stigma too, because I mean, I like to think of myself as somewhat of a bridge between the literary and the, and the big five and like the kind of traditional kind of stuff. And then also this kind of new and emerging stuff. Like I'm not somebody who's rejecting it, you know, like I'm not somebody who's trying to reject that stuff. I, I'm fascinated and I'm curious and I've thought about it myself. You know, I have quite a backlog of books that I've been trying to get published traditionally and I'm in frustration sets in and I start thinking to myself, you know, should I just put it out there? Because ah. What do I have to lose, right? Yeah. And put it out and just see how it goes. Start collecting emails and do the whole fucking thing, dude. And it's like uh, this stigma. And I I think that it's – and I have friends who have published traditionally, you know, that have 
I've had them on the podcast. Listeners, you can go listen to them. They're they're talking about what it was. What the, and I'm talking people that aren't you know Stephen King or huge names. These are people that have one or two books out. You know, not a name you would recognize as a writer, but they're still you know they're publishing books and they're quite good writers. And it's like my friend told me she got a book deal with uh, Collins Harper Collins, and you know you don't get much money for that. I think the advance was you know very small, like you know. 2500 to 10 grand or something for the advance yeah. and then you get no marketing nothing you don't get everyone's like oh well, i want to have a launch party and i want to be in bookstores well they don't even give you that anymore especially if, yeah. unless you're like a huge name you don't get that you don't get a tour they're not going to put you up in a hotel to go tour in europe or something to launch this book and drive to- sales all of that shit yourself. And she was saying, yeah, she had to set up her own book launches. Like she said yep. that the one thing they gave her was they gave her a book launch in New York at like some bar with, you know, like 50 people or something. That was it because that's what they do for every book because it's a big, big publisher, you know, Harper Collins or something. But, you know, she said she was doing stuff herself. She was setting up like events at local bookstores where she was living at the time. And just having to do that all herself and go there and, you know, yeah, nobody's showing up. And then, you know... Uh, just having to deal with it, no marketing money, nothing like that. And so it's like, well, if that's what you're getting for your, for going the traditional route, you know, why even bother? And then it comes down to the prestige, right? It comes down to that pat on the back. Like we were talking about that kind of approval of, of maybe like the people that are supposed to know what good books are, or the people that are supposed to be in charge of making something a bestseller. I've also seen some interesting articles written about on how that the size of the advance directly correlates to how much marketing you're going to get, how much money yeah. they spend on you up front. Well, that determines how much they're going to spend on marketing to earn that back or try to earn that back. Yeah. So when you're a first time author, listeners out there, I know many of you struggling to, to get yourself out there and you're not sure. Well, yeah, I mean, there's good reason to want that, but then you know you see the success. Like if you're good, even if you're if you're doing something that people want to buy, well then even the big five start to notice. Yeah, they will come to you. Yeah, and it's almost like it's easier than it ever has been to put yourself out there with those, and even make a living. Even if it's a modest living, you could do that easier with. A high production and self-publishing than you could with taking years to write something and hope you get a $50,000 contract, you know, if that. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot more too. And like I told you before, and I get kind of getting rejection emails now are kind of like, come on, man, like, what do I got to do? You know, what do I got to do here to show you that I'm worthy of your time? And it's like, well, one way you could do that, listeners, is sell it yourself. You know, go out there and start selling. And be like, well, I sold this many copies. How many are your debut authors selling? You know, how many are you selling out here? Um, yeah. And you see it. I mean, you know, you hear the great success story, Sanderson, Colleen Hoover, and, and a couple others that are that's just become these household names. Like, who's taking up? space in these airport bookstores and stuff well guess what it's these people a lot of them that started self-publishing it's the ones like james patterson who have been grandfathered in the danielle Steele. they've been grandfathered in because they were publishing at a time when publishing was just loaded you could make a shitload of money with doing the traditional publishing thing and they have reputations now over like 30 40 years and then it's these people that have just started putting out on blogs or self-publishing on amazon that are taking up space on these these bookshelves now, because that's what people want. They want yeah. those types of books that traditional publishing is overlooking. But that leads me to this question here: Where the, what would you say, or is the benefit, or uh, the benefits and the negatives of self-publishing? Um, <clears throat> the benefits would be to completely be in control of what you're doing. Um, the downside would be being completely in control of what you're doing (laughs) because self-publishing like the key word in there is publishing and a lot of writers are not publishers and just are not capable of figuring out marketing and how to fucking generate interest in something you're doing and um, there's a lot of writers out there, but there's very few publishers out there. Right. So even if you're self-published, that 
just means you hit the publish button on KDP. Like you have no fucking idea what you're doing. So unless you can do the other work that a publisher would do. Hey, would you believe there's still an extra hour of conversation left? Well, there is. Matt and I chatted for hours while recording this. And if you want to hear the full uncensored episode, you need to subscribe at patreon.com slash heavy board, where you will receive full uncensored episodes like this without any interruptions, ads, or anything else. And that's for subscribers only at patreon.com slash heavy board. So what are you waiting for? Stop sitting on the sidelines. Subscribe today and join the conversation. Heavy. Board. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Board. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.